It's a pleasure to be back in Seattle. It's a pleasure to be back at Town Hall. I, I love this place, I love the city. It's a great city, this is a great venue, and what we're and the staff do here at Town Hall Seattle is phenomenal. It's so important uh, for us all to have a chance to get together and talk about the issues uh, that are so important to all of us. And one of the great things about Seattle is it fosters that kind of uh, community communication. Um, it's been quite a day. Uh, here we are in May Day in Seattle, um, and Seattle is vibrant, full of demonstrations, um, um, uh, paying uh, uh, with its fist in the air to Donald Trump's 100 days and saying, um, uh, we're, we're in a different part of the country. We're the other Washington. <laughs> if there's alternative... <laughs> If there are alternative facts, there are alternative places in the country, right? Um, but I want to talk with you tonight, and hope you join me in the conversation, about the state of our democracy. And I say that very uh, particularly, our democracy. Not our government, not our administration. We're very much caught up in the media and in our public dialogue. Uh, in thinking about talking about what Donald Trump is doing in the presidency, how he got to the presidency, and I'll get into that in a little bit, um, and whether or not we're for or against Donald Trump. And I really want to get beyond that subject because our democracy is in trouble in a much more fundamental way, and it has been for quite a while. It is not the result of the last election. In some ways, Donald Trump's presidency is a symptom of where our democracy has come as well as a potential problem for where it goes and opportunity in the, in the eyes of some other people. But we really need to get back and think about some fundamentals. So I want to talk to you for a moment about the election of, uh, or take an adventure with you, uh, looking at the election of 2016 as an MRI in America. Instead of looking at the tactics and the strategies of the campaigns and the candidates, let's look at it from above and see what it tells us about the state of the country at the point the country went to the polls. I don't mean to the polls in November. I mean, we started going to the polls, remember, in January, went all through the whole year. And we talk about the election of 2016, we're not just talking about the general election, Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, we're talking about three elections. We're talking about the election in the Democratic Party, that picked the nominee, the election in the Republican Party that picked the nominee, and then the general election. And what's striking to me is a longtime reporter in Washington, uh, having covered a whole bunch of elections, is that this election was very different from other elections that we've had in recent years, uh, or recent decades. Typically, American elections are fought on a horizontal plane, horizontal axis, right against left, liberal against conservative, blue against red. This election was fought on a vertical axis. This was an election of a revolt, a mutiny from below against the establishment up above in both parties. It's very important to think about that. I mean, we, you know, we've taken it for granted, we sort of absorbed it, but we've forgotten it. We had that 73-year-old democratic socialist from a state that is not known for a very heavy electoral college count, Vermont, right, Bernie Sanders? He starts from nowhere. The media doesn't take him seriously. Other politicians don't say, take him seriously. Certainly the Clinton campaign didn't take him seriously. And what does he do? He runs across the country and he carries 21 states and he wins 14 million votes. And he nearly knocks off someone who was assumed by everybody to simply be going through the, the political coronation. And what that tells us was that Bernie Sanders was able to tap into something very deep, very fundamental, very emotional, and very alive, and full of the kindling of fire in the belly of America. He talked revolution. He's got a post-election organization, and it's called Our Revolution, right? He was talking about the inequality of income. He was talking about the power of Wall Street. He was talking about Hillary Clinton making $600,000 speaking fees from Goldman Sachs. He was talking about a political system that was dominated by mega money and dark money, by gerrymandering, by special interests, and it resonated. It resonated because people felt that way, and he gave voice to the frustrations and the anger deep in the belly of this country. That's why he came so close. 
So what that says is to the left of center, center and left, there was this passion, this anger, this division within the Democratic Party. And then on the other side, we have a total political neophyte. We have occasionally had that in our past, generals, Ulysses Grant, Dwight Eisenhower. No political experience running against a bunch of establishment candidates who'd been senators and governors in the Republican Party. And nobody takes him seriously. He proceeds to offend just about every electorate that you can imagine, every constituency you can imagine. He's a misogynist, he's against uh, Mexican-Americans, he's against Muslims, he's a predator. He, do, he does everything that you could imagine a candidate could do wrong, and he wins. Now, what you say to that is it's outrageous, it's terrible, it shouldn't happen. But as a political observer and as an analyst, as a reporter, I have to say, how does it happen? How does the hummingbird fly? How does the bee stay aloft? And how does Donald Trump win? And what does that tell us about America? He's the only one of the candidates on the Republican side who said that trade agreements had cost us millions of middle class jobs. He was the only one on the Republican side who said that we've been run by an establishment, even in our party, that's leaving behind millions of middle class Americans. He said, I'm going to stand behind Social Security and, and Medicare, when most of the Republican candidates were saying, you know, we've got to privatize, we've got to change these fundamental protectors of the safety and security and the benefits of the middle class in this country. And he said, believe it or not, I don't know if you know anything about what the H-1B program is, but the H-1B is a visa program that brings into this country, allows high-tech companies like Microsoft and Apple and Google uh, and Oracle and you name them down the line, and banks in New York, J.P. Morgan, uh, the rest of them, Citibank, to import college-educated foreigners to take jobs in American companies making one-third, one-half, one-quarter, well below average American salaries. These are knowledge economy jobs. This has been going on since 1990. It's not supposed to be that they can fire Americans and cause them to require them to, retrain, to train their own replacements. But that's been going on. Trump was the only Republican candidate who even mentioned that that was going on. Now, that may have gone by you while, while he was doing a whole lot of other outrageous things. But it resonated with a whole lot of people on the other side. And so you have another candidate on the Republican side who is tapping into that same sense of anger, frustration, and being left behind that Bernie Sanders was tapping into on the Democratic side. So in both parties, you have this vertical battle, the middle against the top, the people against the establishment, the forgotten against the fortunate, the worried against the wealthy. That's what's going on. That's what the election of, of 2016 was about. And when we get into the final general election, Trump manages to label Hillary just enough as being the voice of Goldman Sachs. And she and the Democratic Party establishment, the Democratic Party strategist, fail to recognize that this is a serious grievance in the body politic. Yes, there are all kinds of things you can say. What, what Comey said and did about the investigation of Hillary's emails and what he didn't say about Trump's, uh, you know, and, and what the media covered and didn't cover in her emails and so forth. Yes, those had effects. But when you look at the loss of states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan, and you look at what the turnout was, when you look at who didn't turn out, in a place like Milwaukee, Milwaukee County. Milwaukee County is a heavily Democratic area. Large percentages of blacks, uh, Hispanics, and poor whites. The turnout in Milwaukee County was 60,000 lower in 2016 than in 2012. A whole lot of Democrats didn't bother to go out to vote. And my contention would be they did not feel a connection with Hillary Clinton. And I don't think it was about personality. I think it was about the issue of being economically forgotten and telling them I have a plan to do X, Y, or Z. 
was not connecting with them in the same way as a guy said, who railed against the trade agreements. By the way, trade agreements that good economists tell us actually cost us the export of five million American jobs, either through NAFTA, through the accession of China to the World Trade Organization and most favored nation treatment by the United States, through the Korean Trade Agreement and the Central American Trade Agreement, negotiated by both Republican and Democratic presidents. So, so these guys, Sanders and Trump, were tapping into something very fundamental that was going on in America that none of the other people running against them really got in the same way. Whatever they said, they were putting out pro forma, and it didn't connect. So we've just had a very profound election that's shaken up the politics of this country, and we're really not sure where it's going. Now we've got somebody in the White House who is thrashing around one way or another with most of the time what I would call the illusion of action, not action itself. When you sign 29 executive orders, half of which call for studies, reports, panels, somebody's going to report in six months or, or in a year, you're not actually taking action, but it looks like action and it feels good to the people who supported him. But the rest of folks are running around worrying considerably with good reason. What's going to happen to the environment? What's going to happen uh, to workers' benefits? What's going to happen to all kinds of issues that are important? And so we have now a new burst of civic activism in this country. We have a new reaction of resistance to Trump an activation, you had demonstrations here today and probably in lots of other cities in the country uh, on both sides, pro-Trump and anti-Trump. So we're now in many ways a more activated country, a more activated citizenry than we've been for a long time during a non-campaign period. And that can be either good or bad. I see a lot of good potential in that uh, as well as some downsides, but the downside risks to our uh, democracy is considerable. It's considerable because the economic discontent and the economic dislocation is so profound. We are a deeply divided country. And most of the time when the press talks about a deeply divided country, they're talking Republicans, Democrats, they're talking red, blue, they're talking hyper-partisanship, and it's there. But the far more profound and far more important division in this country is economic. We're divided by money. And money gets translated in power and those millions start rolling into the campaigns in the hundreds of millions, in the hundreds of millions and then into the billions. And they've been skyrocketing. We all know that. We're divided by money, we're divided by power, and we're divided by something I've tried to put a label on, but I call it economic destiny. It isn't just where you are. It's where you are relative to where you were and where you expect to be. A lot of people call it opportunity. I think for a lot of folks, it's not opportunity. It's the lack of opportunity. But what they see, it, and if you look at the voting, by the way, in 2016, what's interesting is Hillary Clinton actually carried the poorest people in this country. If you look at the, the, the economics of the, uh, the, the voting record of the people who made, whose family incomes are below $50,000 a year, Hillary Clinton carried them by about 10%. But from 50 to 110 or $120,000, Donald Trump won by 110%, uh, by 10%, excuse me. This is the middle class. You'd think they were fairly well off. Well, they are, but they're downwardly mobile. They're economically anxious. These are people who feel forgotten, who feel worried, who feel unable to secure their own future, their own retirement, and particularly worried that they can't deliver for their children what they hoped to and what they felt their parents delivered for them. This is a critical body of people in this country, and they've lost faith in the system. They've lost faith in the leadership. They've lost faith in conventional politics. And they're thrashing around looking for anybody who's different and who can fix things. One of the most interesting pieces of information to me about the last election in terms of looking at numbers is to look at 20 or 25 rural small town counties in the state of Wisconsin. Now these counties, 
went heavily for Obama in 2008 and 2012, and they went for Trump. You've been told that. But they also went, in state elections, they went for Scott Walker, Republican, hardline, right-wing, pro-business, anti-union, anti-benefit, Republican governor of the state of Wisconsin. And they also voted for Tammy Baldwin, a liber liberal, lesbian, Democratic senator. What that says to me is those voters don't have any idea who they're voting for. They just want to vote for somebody different. Obama promised change. Trump promised change. Walker promised change. Baldwin promised change. Um, what they're saying is conventional politics don't work. And I think that tells you that's part of this MRI about America that I'm trying to share with you. Now, what's interesting is that's, that in sometimes it's very hard to fathom and to figure out. And it was certainly a dilemma for both President Obama and certainly Hillary Clinton running. Because if you look at the macroeconomics of America going into the 2016 election, the macroeconomics look good. 72 months of growth. Uh, the unemployment rate has come down from 10% to under 5%. In 2015, the average, the median wage in America went up 2%, 2.9%, 2 and in 2016, it went up 2%. So that looks good. And you would have thought that was a good, positive record to run on. But the microeconomics, not the macroeconomics looking at the nation as a whole, but the microeconomics seen from the, from the perspective of the family look terrible. If you were in the median family in America, or tens of millions of median families, people whose household income was somewhere between 40 and 75 or 80,000 a year, your income was lower in 2016 than it was in 2007, before the economic downturn. It was lower than it was in 1999. Now think about what that means. If the median household income is lower in 2016 than in 1999 for these median families, these middle, middle families, that means for tens of millions of people, the American economy is actually going backwards for 17 or 18 years. That's what we're talking about. That is an experience that most of us in this room, certainly I, can't claim to have any real personal knowledge of or feel for. I try to understand it, I try to report it, I try to listen to people, but I can't live it. It's not where I live. And I think that's one of the problems with the people who are making decisions in the Democratic Party. Now, you can say Trump was totally cynical about it. He spotted it. He realized it. He saw that was a, a vulnerable spot, and he exploited it. But the point was he did give voice to that discontent. The other point is that discontent remains with us today. It has not been dealt with. And it is even worse today because, as you probably noticed if you read the papers over the last few days, the growth rate in the first quarter of 2017 was, what, 0.7% as opposed to 2.5% at the end of 2016. Now, whether that will continue or not, we don't know. But consumer buying, which is really the driving force of the American economy, people talk about the job creators all the time as if the job creators were on Wall Street as if the job creators were the top 1%. No, ladies and gentlemen, the job creators in America are sitting in this room. It is you. It is us. It is American consumers. The secret to the great American growth period from the end of World War II to the end of the 1970s was that prosperity was shared. Big business leaders thought it was good business and smart economics to pay tens of millions of Americans well because American workers go out and spend what they earn 95% of what they earn in good times and 105% of what they earn in bad times. And that's what drove the American economy. And if the wealth isn't adequately shared, our growth slows down. There's a huge secret that at the moment isn't even being discussed while Trump's tax plan is being discussed. This enormous um, bonus that he wants, the bonanza he wants to give the rich. 
It is utter malarkey what is being said, not only by the president, but by most press people who are analyzing it. It is not true that cutting taxes causes growth. The period when we had the highest taxes in America, Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s, the, ma the top marginal tax rate, the tax rate on the top people, was 92%. It dropped down to 77% on a John F. Kennedy in the 1960s. And during those two decades, the average growth of the American economy was a little bit over 3%. Fast forward to the early 2000s. Under both George W. Bush, the Republican, and Barack Obama, the Democrat, the maximum marginal tax rate was down to 35%, okay? So you would have thought we'd been growing three times as fast. Uh-uh. The, the average growth rate even before the economic downturn of 2008, was a little over 1%. There is no connection whatsoever. And research by the Congressional Research Service, as well as by good economists like Joe Stiglitz, who won a Nobel uh, Prize for econ Economics at, uh, at Columbia University, or Paul Krugman at Princeton, or, uh, or, or a number of others, uh, shows absolutely clearly that high inequality of income is bad for growth. And that if you bring the income levels at the bottom of the top closer together, as by the way you've tried to do by raising the minimum wage here in Seattle, you actually get faster growth over a long period of time. So that's not what we did. We went the other direction. So we have this high inequality, and inequality was the gut issue of the 2016 election. It's what lay behind it, it's what drove the vote, it's what determined the challenge, and actually in the end, determined the winners uh, in the Republican Party and, and the Democratic Party, well not the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party and in the general election. So we have this divide that is troubling us. And then the difficulty is that that divide then goes and spills over into our political system. We have this hyper-concentration of wealth. By the way, it's almost impossible to believe. I don't know if, if, what your reaction was. When I first heard the slogan, the 99% and the 1%, and saw the bumper stickers of Occupy Wall Street, I thought, that is really a clever bumper sticker. That is really a clever slogan. But it's not accurate. I mean, it isn't the 99% and the 1%. Well, I found out later, um, I read, read some economic stuff, uh, and there's a very good Princeton economist uh, whose name is slipping my mind at the moment. Alan Kruger is his name. Um, he reported, based on some economic research done by people at UC Berkeley and actually at the Sorbonne in Paris and elsewhere, 84% of the entire nation's growth in income from 1979 to 2012 went to the top 1%. 84% of, I'm saying it twice because you really have to hear it twice to even begin to absorb it. When I read this figure, I just couldn't believe it. 84% went to the top 1% over 32 years. You do the arithmetic quickly, if they got 84%, that means all the rest of us, the other 99%, got 16% of the nation's growth. That means over three decades, the top 1% got five times as much of the nation's growth and in income as the entire rest of the country. So the 99% and the 1% bumper sticker is absolutely right. It's not a slogan. It's not empty words. It is reality. And that reality is sitting there aching this country today. And unless we can find a way to deal with that issue, I think it is going to ache with us the same way that slavery ached with America in the mid-19th century. This is a deep, deep cleavage. When I went to Oxford after finishing Williams, uh, one of the things I did was to read some of the work of Arnold Toynbee, the great British historian, who wrote a, a study called A Study of History. It studied 21 human civilizations over 6,000 years to understand how they rose and how they fell. I want to admit to you right now, I did not read all 12 volumes. I, but I did read um, uh, Bridgewell's 
uh, two volume uh, abbreviation of it, which is 1,200 pages. And what Toynbee says is that civilizations rise and fall depending on a dynamic of challenge and response. They're all challenged in some way. And they either respond effectively and they rise and they endure and they live on into history or they fail to meet their challenges and they fall onto the ash heap of history. He starts way back with ancient Egyptian civilization on the Nile and with the Inca civilization in Latin America, in the mountains of Latin America, which, what is now Peru. And the challenge he said they faced was, was an environmental challenge. Hostile environment, in the case of Egypt, arid lands. Could they actually establish an agricultural economy that would sustain human civilization and communities, large communities, that could live together? Well, we know they did that. We don't have the evidence of how they lived, but they left behind these magnificent temples in Machu Picchu, uh, and all the temples up and down the Nile and the pyramids, so they had enough excess wealth that they had generated to be able to build those pyramids that have lasted for centuries. But they fell to another challenge, which is the challenge of an external invader. An invader that was militarily more powerful and more modern. In the case of the Egyptians, it was the Ottoman Turks. In the case of the Peruvians, the Incas, it was the Spaniards. Now, what's interesting is that's a challenge we know something about. We've met and we've defeated it. Uh, we met it and defeated it, and, and uh, actually in our own revolution in a way, but certainly we did it during World War II with Hitler and the Axis powers. Uh, we did it again uh, facing the Soviet Union in the long 50 years of the Cold War in the second half of the 20th century. But what's interesting to me is that when Toynbee gets to the civilizations that we admire the most, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, they fell victim to another challenge. It's a challenge that, that Toynbee calls schisms in the soul, schisms in the soul of the society, schisms in the body politics, schisms, divisions, uh, internal conflicts within the society, which is what he concludes in the end brought down ancient Greece and brought down ancient Rome. Well, when I read that and I thought about that, I read that back then, I didn't think about it now, but when I thought back about it as I was working on my book, Who Stole the American Dream? I said, my God, that's where we are. Our challenge today, we're gonna to have to deal with terrorism. We're gonna to have to deal with North Korea's nuclear weapon. But our biggest challenge is inside our country. Our biggest challenge is whether or not we can actually have our political system work. Whether or not we can begin to address this enormous problem of economic inequality, whether or not we can address climate change, whether or not we can address how to deal with the, the entitlement program, Social Security and, and Medicare, and make sure that they last on for the next generations, education, you name it, whatever the issue is. You know, for the last several years, we haven't really addressed effectively any of those issues. We can't even pass a budget. I know, you're going to get a lot of hallelujahs this week because we're passing a continuing resolution. Do you know what a continuing resolution is? It's basically a resolution that says we can't agree on what to do, so we're just going to continue to do what we have been doing with a couple of tweaks here and there. I can tell you when I first went to Washington as a reporter for the New York Times in the early 60s and on through the 70s and 80s, the Republicans and the Democrats fought. And Richard Nixon and, and Lyndon Johnson were totally different people, and so they passed budgets every year. They passed programs to send people to the moon. They built national highway programs. They passed Medicare and Medicaid. They did a whole lot of legislation. We got a little bit of it in Obama's first two years. He did better than most by passing the things that he did. But since then, and what's interesting, we're having, we're having a new president with the same party. We're looking at party labels controlling all three centers of power, the House, the Senate, and the White House. And he's running into the same kind of problems that we had when Obama was president facing an opposition party. I'm going to get to why in a moment. But think about that. So we're not getting things done. And when we think about the political system, we either want to laugh about it or we want to cry about it. The laughter is, for me, is that famous old Peanuts cartoon, the one where Lucy has a card table set up in the backyard. It says, Psychiatry One Cent. Well, you know who comes up. Charlie Brown comes up, puts his penny down. And Lucy says to Charlie, you know, Charlie, before I can give you any advice, you have to think of life as a voyage on a great ocean liner. Some people take their deck chair to the bow. 
and they look into the future to see where they're going. And other people take their deck chair to the stern and they look into the past to see where they've come from. Which group do you belong to? And Charlie scratches his head. He said, Lucy, I'm having trouble getting my chair unfolded. <laughs> so that's the laughter side. But the other side is, we don't think the government works for us anymore. We don't feel connected to it. We see it swamped by money. We see it singing to the tune of special interests. We sense that Wall Street and big business has captured the capital. We have a sense, uh, maybe not so much in this state, but in lots of states, a sense that politicians have rigged their home districts so they've got guaranteed re-election and the only thing we can do is term, term limit them to get them out of there. We have this sense of being excluded. If you ask people what they think about the political system, in poll after poll after poll, 70 to 80 percent of people will say it's broken. Public confidence, the poll that interests me is the question of public confidence in the political system. If you ask them, people about their opinion of before he got near retirement, Obama, but certainly now Trump and Congress and Republicans and Democrats and lawyers and the media and everybody else, we're all way down there at rock bottom. But the poll that really matters to me is public confidence in the political system is at its lowest point in 40 years. People don't believe the system is working for them anymore. We have government of and by the politicians and the parties and the special interests for government of the special interests, the parties and the politicians instead of government of, by and for the people. We're a long way away. That's what I meant at the outside when I said our democracy is in trouble. It's in deep trouble. And the question is, two questions. How did it get this way? And is there anything we can do about it? Well, this trouble built over a long period of time, but 2010 was a watershed year. 2010 was a year in which two really big things happened to our political system. The first was a decision by the Supreme Court in the Citizens United case that corporations and unions could spend unlimited money from their own treasuries, which had previously been forbidden. Now, most people don't know it, but there was actually a law passed in 1907. 1907? Under Teddy Roosevelt and, and William Howard Taft in that era, that corporate money couldn't go into politics. So as part of the progressive era, they were already addressing a problem that is now aching our society today. Citizens United knocked that out. And what's happened in the, in the money system is just impossible to believe. Let's just take dark money. You hear a lot about dark money. Dark money just means it's money that we know is spent because people have to file some report on what is spent. But it is, it is covered under such an umbrella name that we can't figure out who actually gave the money. We can't tell who is the piper that's calling the tune. We can't see it. In 2006, the amount of dark money in American politics was $5.2 million. In 2012, it was $300 million. That's what happened after Citizen United. In 2016, it was well over half a billion. Each election is going up. The cost of the elections went up. 2012, 2016, we now have elections that, that cost now six, seven billion dollars. And by the way, from the standpoint of major funders, corporations, special interests, Koch brothers, you name it, putting a hundred million dollars into a, an election is cheap because you're going to wind up by getting laws written for you that are going to wind up by saving you billions. There's a high multiplier effect on what happens. And by the way, people say government doesn't work. Government works. It works for the people who pay for it to work for them. Okay? We don't like that. We're upset about that. That happened in 2010. The other thing that happened in 2010, people don't know much about, and it hasn't been explained very well by the media, and people haven't focused on. In 2010, something happened called Red Map. Red Map was a Republican program 
to try to capture control of as many state legislatures across the country so that after the 2010 census and the reapportionment of con congressional seats all across the country, that they would be in control of more legislatures and would be able to draw the maps for the political districts for Congress. And they did extremely well. The Democrats were paying no attention to this. It only cost $30 million dollars in terms of American politics. The $30 million dollars the Republicans invested in state elections and very carefully targeted individual state elections uh, around the country and in probably 10 or 11 key states was not terribly expensive. It cost them $30 million. dollars. But when they finished, Republicans controlled the legislature and the governor's chair in states that controlled 40% of the seats in Congress and the Democrats 10%. And the other 50% had some kind of split control. Republicans went to work and they drew the lines. Now, you, you've probably heard from some people, it doesn't matter how the lines are drawn, uh, the way the vote goes is really determined by the fact that liberals and Democrats and whatnot, minorities particularly, live in the cities, and conservatives and Republicans tend to live in the countryside. And so it's what, what somebody wrote back in 2008, a very good book called The Big Sort. We just sorted ourselves out and it just that's the way the cookie crumbles. Not true, not true. Let me just take one state for you, state of Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, in 2010, the vote between the Republicans and the Democrats was pretty even. And so was the congressional delegation. It was about nine to nine, they had 18 seats. In 2012, the vote was pretty even, but the Democrats had an edge, slightly more votes than the Republicans. But the Republicans had done the gerrymandering in, in Pennsylvania in 2011, and they got 13 seats and the Democrats got five. Now this is not just done by the Republicans. The Democrats do it in Massachusetts, and they do it in Illinois. They do it in my former home state of Maryland. They do it in other states as well. It's just the Republicans were one hell of a lot smarter and a hell of a lot better about it. And the modern computer technology has made it so sophisticated that they can arrange districts extremely well by packing their opponents in a few districts and spreading out their own strength in many. And what happened across the country in 2012 was that the Democrats actually carried the vote for Congress by a million and a half votes. They got a million and a half more votes for seats in the House of Congress in 2012 than Republicans, but Republicans got a 33 vote, 33 seat majority in the House of Representatives. Now it's interesting about today's politics and about the way the government works is that the gerrymandering of districts around the country helped create what is called the Freedom Caucus, which you've probably heard of recently because the Freedom Caucus and, the, and another dozen or so congressmen and the Republican backbenches who sit around and coalesce with them prevented the passage, and maybe they're going to go along with it, they prevented the passage of the repeal of Obamacare against Donald Trump. What you need to know is they're also the same people who blocked all kinds of legislation that Obama wanted, voted on, and they shut down the government several times under Obama. And they're also the same people who knocked off John Boehner and deposed him. They, those people, all but two of them, come from absolute gerrymander-protected districts, and so when the polls say the public doesn't like what's going on, when the rest of Congress is unhappy about it, these people are insulated from public opinion by gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is directly affecting all kinds of political decisions. When the Senate under Obama passed an immigration reform bill, the House Republican leadership couldn't even bring it to a vote in the House because this block of gerrymander-protected Republicans wouldn't let it come to a vote. This is what Jerry Manor is doing, not just to this president, but to the dysfunctionality of our political system. So these two things, money and gerrymandering, have come together, and they've absolutely caused our political system both to be unrepresentative, and with dark money to be non-transparent, and not to be fair, and not to be workable. Now our next question is, is there anything we can do about it? The great news is yes, and the great news is it's already happening. The problem is, the bad news is, 
The press isn't telling you the good news. The good news is that not only in Washington state, uh, which has voted, along with several other states, to roll back Citizens United and call for a, con a constitutional amendment to restore the power of Congress and the states to regulate campaign finance. And Seattle has passed an honest elections bill with a bit of public funding in it. And there are other efforts that have been underway here. There's a modified gerrymander reform uh, at work, a bipartisan commission at work in Washington state. But beyond that, Connecticut has now for five election cycles had a system of public funding of campaigns for state elections, not for Congress, not for the Senate, but for governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, all the seats in the House of Representatives for five cycles. And do you know 80% of the Republicans and Democrats who run voluntarily, who run for the legislature, voluntarily take part? And that every single candidate in the last gubernatorial race and for any statewide office, they took public funding. And what difference does it make? It means they, can't, they have to raise some money to qualify, but it's a modest amount and they have to raise it in their home districts. What happens is campaigns suddenly get about candidates talking with voters, candidates talking about issues, public debates instead of people spending all their time dialing for dollars. What happens is in the legislature, you suddenly have people who couldn't afford to run for office, running for office. The number of blacks and, and Latinos in the Connecticut legislature has tripled since this system went into, off, went into effect. People from the inner city of Bridgeport and New Haven and Hartford who couldn't run because there wasn't enough money in their political districts to be able to run. And where candidates used to depend on their party leadership to get the money from PACs and lobbyists and contractors for state, project, for state contracts, now it's done at the local level. And when they get into the legislature, they can actually pass and act on legislation that used to be bottled up by lobbyists. Lobbyists, like everybody else, they can't give any more than $100. Average person can give anywhere from $5 to $100, no more. No corporate contributions, no PAC contributions directly to the candidates. They have to go to the parties. The parties can help out the candidates a little bit. It has changed the political climate in Connecticut. It operates there. There are three or four states Maine, Connecticut, Minnesota, and Arizona all have robust public funding programs going on statewide. And I noticed in 2016 you made an effort in Washington State to take the Seattle idea of democracy vouchers statewide, and it didn't pass. So it's a big issue that happens. They've done that in Connecticut. In Florida, not exactly one of the states that you would figure would be in the front of, of reform in America. In Florida, they have enacted the boldest, strongest, clearest gerrymander reform in the country. The voters in Florida in 2010, the very same year that Citizens United came out, the very same year that Red Map went into effect, the very same year that Florida elected a Republican governor and a Republican legislature, 62.5% of the voters in Florida voted for a plan that said you cannot redistrict, you cannot draw the lines of the election districts in this state with, quote, the intent to favor one political party over the other, unquote, or to keep incumbents in office right clear. Guess what? Republican legislators said, fine, it's a great thing, we're going to do it, it's going to be the best uh, redistricting that's ever happened in the state of Florida. Total lie. They went engaged in a conspiracy, they did an underground uh, gerrymander, it took the League of Women Voters and Common Cause and Fair Districts Florida three years arguing in the court until they got a decision from the Florida Supreme Court that this was a blatantly unconstitutional gerrymander in Florida and the state of Florida and the legislature had to, had to reshape eight congressional districts. If you have to do eight out of 27, you wind up by having to do about 15. And they sh totally shook up uh, the state congressional delegation. And they said, you have to redraw the lines for the entire state Senate, 40 different districts. This last election, 2016, was the first held under that new court order um, redrawing of the maps and the congressional delegation in Florida began to change. It's probably going to take another couple of cycles uh, to do it uh, in an extensive way. But the point was the people in Florida were able to do that. In Washington State, you've put in an absolute model program, the top two primary. What a genius idea. What we've had in America over the last 30 years is the gradual separation of the political parties. Political scientists used to, used to chart the votes of members of Congress 
like Rorschach, and they overlapped. The liberal Republicans overlap with the conservative Democrats, and over the last 30 years, they've opened apart, and there's a no man's land between them. We have no middle. You can't govern in Washington if both parties are, are at the end zones. You gotta get somebody out in the middle of the field to play with each other, to make the compromises that make democracy work. So when you get a top two primary that forces everybody to run in the same primary and all the politicians to try to appeal across the board, you start to get moderate opinion. And I don't know if you know it, but people who have studied the congressional vote patterns have told me that in the current Washington state delegation, the party lineup may be the same as it was 10 years ago, but none of the members of your delegation are in the outer 20% of either party. They are all playing somewhere between the 20 yard lines and the middle of the field. That's a huge change. If we had that happen in 10 states, Congress would start to behave differently. If we had gerrymander reform and top two primaries, tremendous difference. We have disclosure laws that are really powerful and important in California, in, in Massachusetts, in other states. 25 of the American states are now engaged in some form of effort to change partisan gerrymandering. They're either lawsuits, they're citizens' movements, or they're changes like the ones that have been done in Washington State. I need to see where we are in time. I was gonna show you a film of South Dakota because I went to South Dakota last fall with Kevin Ely, my cameraman who's sitting right down here. South Dakota, an unbelievably red state. Why are we going there to cover political reform? They had on the ballot in South Dakota last fall a nonpartisan primary like the one uh, that you have here in Washington State, um, a constitutional amendment, um, a, 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 a public funding bill, uh, and a gerrymander reform bill. They had everything. It's a, it's a red state, you think nothing is gonna happen. Public funding passed in South Dakota, 52% of the vote. It failed here in Washington State, it happened in South Dakota. Now the legislators come back, legislatures come back, dominated 80% Republican, just killed it because they don't want anybody challenging them, start giving public money around. Why, my God, the challenges might actually beat us. We might actually have a competitive election. They don't want that. The reformers are going back. If we have time later on, I'll show you this film. It's really amazing just simply to see this going on in a state like, uh, like South Dakota. The point I want to leave with you is this. Our, our democracy is in danger. There's no way we can get Washington to fix it. The people in Washington don't want, don't want to fix it. They got there through the system that is corrupted by money and dominated by gerrymandering. They like it the way it is. If we don't like it, it's up to us to change it. And the place to change it is right here, ground zero. Seattle, Washington, Portland, Oregon, all across these states and all across South Dakota, Connecticut, Maine, you won't believe it, Arizona has got, a public, has got a, a, an independent commission doing redistricting instead of uh, legislative gerrymandering. There are states that you wouldn't believe are on the map trying to do something. There is hope. There is a way to do this. We can do this, but we have to believe it, and we have to exercise the power we have as we the people. Thanks. Do you see any difference in the political power game um, that we see today versus when you wrote your wonderful uh, book back in two th uh, 1988, The Power Game? Yeah, absolutely, and I've just mentioned a couple of the big changes. One of them is Citizens United and the role of mega money. I mean, there was always an influence of campaign money and campaigns, but nothing like what it is today. And the gerrymandering that we now have nationwide used to be done state by state, and it was a kind of a patchwork pattern. It wasn't good, but it wasn't as organized as it has been. And so the result is that we really have a distorted democracy, number one, and we have a deadlock democracy. I mean, the, the combination of money and gerrymandering is potent. Think about it, if you have a gerrymandered district, it, it's the party primary that becomes the election for Congress, not the general election. And the turnout in party primaries and lots of congressional elections, you won't believe it, is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent. 
I mean, it's really low. And those are real activist voters, and they tend to be the most extreme in each party. So that's what generates campaigns that run to the extreme. I'm going to have to ask somebody else to ask the next question, sir. I know you're looking for a follow-up. Um, and, and it's what causes people to be running in, in Congress at both ends of the political spectrum. So, yes, I would say the power game is different. Uh, and it isn't just the number of zeros on the dollar signs and the campaigns have gone up. It's that potent influence. You can threaten a state legislator in a district in all kinds of states with very little money, and you can turn them around without actually even running an opponent against them. It's, really, it's affected state politics, and it's affected the national politics enormously. Yes, please. Do you think that the Democratic National Committee cost Bernie the nomination, and if he had been the nominee with two non-traditional candidates, would he have beaten Trump? You know, that's a very good question, and of course, it's a question that a lot of people uh, spend a lot of beers over in Washington, I can tell you. Um, I, of course, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, it, it certainly would have been, um, it would have been a very enlightening race. I, I happen to think he could have won, but you really got to do the political arithmetic. I mean, think of the things that would have been off the table. The emails would have been off the table. The Clinton Foundation would have been off the table. Bill Clinton's behavior would have been off the table. Some of the stuff that would have allowed him to focus on uh, Trump's flaws would have, been, uh, would have been a great advantage to him. On the other hand, he would not have had the kind of organization nationwide that Hillary Clinton had built up and the Democratic National Committee had built up. It's an imponderable that we can't get beyond. I'm one of those who would say yes, but I can't begin to prove it. Yeah, this ties in um, the economic equality that you were talking about earlier. Um, you mentioned about, you know, how wages, uh, once they go up and you have the people with more spending power and then the economy grows that way. But um, what's your opinion, and it seems like politicians on either side of the aisle don't care as much as this subject, which is more damaging, uh, the runaway increases in uh, rent, particularly in towns like this, we have a strong economy and people are getting paid more, but then the um, cat chasing this tail effect takes place because you might have like wages that go up like five to 10%, but we have weight, uh, rents that go up by 30, sure. 40, and 50. Uh, how can politicians do anything about that or is there anything that they well, can do? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, that's a very good question. It is, it is a question that's really, in most cases, focused much more on local politics than national because affordable housing is the kind of program that's undertaken by mayors and by city councils. But certainly one of the things that both Clinton and Obama tried to do, uh, it's a little hard to follow you and talk to you while you're walking around, but, uh, uh, okay, thanks. But, but I, I mean, obviously, if you have appropriations, that you can put in to the federal government budget, which encourages the building of Title VIII housing, both public housing and, and uh, some kind of uh, combination of rent subsidies and, and private public funding, you can ease some of those pressures. So there is something, I mean, politicians should be sensitive to that. But I don't think politicians are gonna be sensitive to that unless we fix the gerrymandering, because in too many districts around this country, the politicians know that they can run and win in the next election, particularly if you're a Republican, your only danger is from the right. So that, that person's not even gonna hear your argument, or if they hear your argument, they're not gonna be, it's not gonna be relevant to their future. That's why I keep saying, you know, it sounds like a good government, common cause, League of Women Voters, shouldn't we have a nice clean election? Uh, preaching. And what I'm trying to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, is this has dramatic impact on policy. The inequalities we're seeing today we can't deal with when we have the kind of gerrymandered, money-dominated system. And so what, whatever your issue is, whether it's climate change or affordable housing or after-school programs for kids or Head Start or controlling entitlement spending, you need to put political reform ahead of it because we can't get to those subjects unless we can fix the system. Yes, Diane. Uh -huh. 
Hi, Rick. It's so nice to see you tonight. Thank you. Um, and you too. About a month ago, I listened to a speaker, uh, Shamil Idris, at Pacific Lutheran University talking about uh, his a nonprofit organization called Search for Common Ground. Right. And they do media, mediation and conflict resolution around the world with uh, countries that are in civil conflict. So he was talking about the symptoms of these civil conflicts that were identified in advance of those conflicts. And the major symptom is ungovernability. And his parting comment to the audience of 400 at PLU was, the United States is now in a position of ungovernability, wow. which puts it in, in yeah. puts a sense of urgency to your words tonight. Thank you. Well, uh, I appreciate that reinforcement. Let me just share with you along that line, there are a couple of professors at Duke University who study the effectiveness of democratic government around the world. And they've developed a kind of a rating system, uh, how the election system works, who has access to the ballot, all those kinds of things. And they were running around the world rating other countries. And recently they came out with a study that says North Carolina, their home state, no longer qualifies as a democracy. This is serious. This is serious, I and mean, we laugh about it. I mean, I saw it and I laughed. It's sort of a clever headline. But it's really serious when, when you start to think about American democracy and you can put it on the same sort of scale as Zimbabwe or Cyprus or, or you know, Mongolia and so forth. I mean, we're, we're, you know, we used to regard ourselves as the gold standard. We're nowhere near there anymore. It's really important to understand and how fundamental that is. Thank you, Diane, for the comment. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, I have to ask, where's the press? I mean, in my lifetime, um, the Vietnam War, when I was a kid, was the, you know, the big name on the page. And there was a tremendous amount of press that went after that and from all angles. You know, every night that I go to the gym and I ride the bike, I read the latest uh, Atlantic, uh, The Week, Time, you know, every major publication that I can get my hands on. And I will credit the press in terms of uh, column, you know, columnist writing, like yourself and others, that write really thoughtful pieces. But I'm not seeing it in the papers. All I see in the, the press from the radio and the papers, which seems to me, is screaming about Donald Trump. And I'm not hearing the kind of investigative reporting that's brought to the, to the everyday press and the headlines on page one, page two, and page three that hit the kind of of issues that you're bringing up tonight. And I'm feeling like the press has somehow been defanged or lost power, at least in my lifetime, experiencing that as a voter. Sure. Uh, and I could be wrong about that, but my feeling is where's the power of the press? Good and why idea. aren't they good, engaged good, good, and helping I, the population? I got the question. Good, good question. Um, I don't think there's any question that we have failed. And we've failed badly over time. Um, I've just told you, and, and, and in my book, Who Stole the American Dream, I really go back and track how we got into the inequality we got into. I ran the Washington Bureau. I had 65 reporters working for me uh, during the whole time. My job was basically to understand and put these things together. And I have to admit, I didn't do it until I had time to sit down and go, until the financial crisis sort of forced me to say, what the hell is going on here? How do we get in this kind of a mess, and how bad is it? And it started out as a subprime crisis, if you recall. It was subprime mortgages that were in pro a problem. And it was, in the end, it turned out to be prime mortgages and lots of middle class families. So we missed the biggest story in American history over the last 30 years, which is the growth of inequality. We reported this plant closing and that plant closing and a higher unemployment rate and an uneven economy. But we didn't put the dots together. We didn't connect the dots. And that's part of the problem today. I don't think we've done a good job there. We certainly didn't understand and, and anticipate the appeal and the, and the reason for the appeal of either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. That's part of what I was trying to say. We were very much focused on what they did wrong and, and what was their chance of winning in the horse race rather than saying what is the nature of their appeal and what is that, just what I said tonight, what is the MRI on America that these guys are giving us? That is our job. Our job is to give events meaning to people so that people can understand what's going on. Now, uh, part of, I don't, I don't think it's just that the press has been bought. I think some of the press has been bought. 
Part of what's happened is the 24-7 news cycle has forced reporters and editors to go put stories out faster than they can even work them. We've become stenographers. We just, if Donald Trump tweets, then we can tell you what he tweeted. Oh, well, wait a second. Does it really matter? We're going to have to get to the point here where we say, you know, let's see whether or not this is a reasonable likelihood, and we'll report it, but we'll put it on page 19 and not on page 1. Because the odds are we've learned that it doesn't really matter most of the time. Sometimes he's touching something new like North Korea, and we've got to be careful. You can't, you can't ignore it, and maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't matter, but you want to be safe and, and report. So we've got, to, we've got to use our judgment better. Part of what happened is, and you've seen it in this city, you lost a major paper in this city. The Seattle PI is gone. The Seattle Times probably has, I don't know what the numbers are, but I will bet you 60 or 70% of the new staff that it used to have. 20, 30, 40% is gone. What happens is, when that happens, is the specialized reporters who really know healthcare, who really know the environment, who really know the way the legislature works, who know any issue, and they have the sources. When there's a news development that breaks, they know who to go to talk to. They've got the background, so they write you an intelligent story that adds to the meaning and your understanding of the events. And when you lose that extra manpower, that extra human power to investigate those stories, then you do them in a rush and you toss it to somebody and somebody's writing an environmental story one day and the next day they're doing a story about gun control. And they may be a good reporter, but they don't have the background, the sources of the context. So the economic problem has really affected the way the press is going, and then the oncoming of the internet. But I want to tell you today, I'm now a consumer rather than a reporter of the New York Times, and I want to tell you the coverage of politics and economics in that paper is better than it was when I was there. It is unbelievably good. If you read the New York Times every day, you cannot claim that you're uninformed. I mean, it is in there in depth, whether you're talking about Ivanka's um, uh, pushing her products uh, overseas, or you're talking about the business people who are advising Donald Trump, or you're talking about the internecine battles within the White House, or you're talking about the meaning of the, the proposal on the H-1B program. I mean, it is there in depth. The Washington Post declined in quality, I would say, 10 years ago, nine years ago, five years ago. They got a guy named Marty Barron who was in there. And actually, Jeff Bezos has had a lot to do with the recovery of the Washington Post. He just pumped a lot of money in there. And the, and the, the, the Graham family, which owned it before, couldn't afford to put the money in. So, I, I mean, there's no question that we fell down, the press fell down at, at, in the early parts of the campaign. And the press got burned. And the really good papers and the really good outlets, Politico is a very good outlet now. And they're working hard. And, the, and they're actually running a whole lot of stuff that's tough, that's critical. Of this enterprise that's driving, um, I think it's come back quite a bit. But I share your frustration. I see an awful lot of stuff that I think is shoddy, uh, that I don't pay much attention to. I hear stuff even on good outlets like NPR, and I even see it occasionally at PBS, although I think they do a really good job, both of them generally. But I see stuff that I think is rushed out that has not worked well. So your criticism of the press is certainly well taken. This is very insightful, but we only have time for one more question. After, uh, after you ask your question, if any of you have additional questions, to your right, that table right over there, um, you'll be signing books. Right over here. No, nope, over there. I'm over there? You're over there. Well, OK, the books book, are over here, and I'm over left. there, and I'm signing books. If signing they can books work that right. out, I'll do it. Perfect. All right, fire. So my question has to do with two systemic issues which you haven't touched on. One of which you probably will just say, well, you can't do anything about it, but I'd like to hear your comments on that. Um, and the two systemic issues are um, the fact that Hillary Clinton did win three million more, or nearly three Absolutely. million more votes in the popular vote, and Al Gore won more than a half a million more. So we have a systemic problem with our electoral college, and how can that be addressed, if it can? And the second issue that was very underreported throughout the, the Monday morning quarterbacking and throughout coming up to the election was the issues around voter suppression in many states. And um, those two issues seem to me had a great deal of impact on um, obviously the right. outcome of the election no, um, no. as well as the counts of the number of votes. Yeah. Why didn't people come 
some of them didn't come because they couldn't. Yep. I so couldn't. I'd love to hear your point on that, and I'll take my yep. questions. Uh, I think you're right on both of them. Let's take the Electoral College. Um, we are stuck with an 18th century system, okay? Uh, it's amazing that, that we have as much equanimity and peace about it in this country as we do. Because uh, you're right, Hillary Clinton won three and a half million more votes. The people who live in the rest of the country will say, you know, the five million margin that she got in California. She won California and they won the rest of the country. But that's not the point. The point is, can we get around this to actually have the popular vote win or win? There is an electoral college compact, which I assume you're familiar with, uh, where states have agreed and have passed legislation in their legislatures to say that they will vote their electoral college votes for the national popular vote winner if we get enough states with electoral votes to get to 270, which is what you need to be elected president. At the present time, we have states that have 155 electoral votes that have signed on. So we need more states with another 115 electoral votes. I'm sorry, I don't know where Washington State is on this. I don't know whether or not Washington State has done this. Is that right? Washington State has done it, okay. What's interesting is it sounds impossible to do, but it's not because there are another 19 or 20 states in which one house or the other of that state's legislature has at one point or another passed a bill to accept the National Electoral College Compact. This is definitely an issue that some people are working on and pushing hard, particularly in the wake of the last election. There's no question this is a major problem for us. Um, I think it's happened four times in our history, but what's interesting is two of them have been in the last 16 years. So it is clearly a new and acute problem, particularly with the changing demographics of this country. So that is definitely something we should address. Um, in terms of voter suppression, you're also right on, as far as I'm concerned. And by the way, on our website, reclaimtheamericandream.org, uh, you will find lots of material on the whole problem of voter suppression and voter rights and which states have been pushing photo ID, laws that basically are stacked against certain constituencies. In Texas, for example, um, if you have a hunting license with your picture on it, if you have a gun license with your picture on it, it is an acceptable form of identification to register to vote. But if you're a student in a state university and you have a student ID card, that is not acceptable. If you are a public welfare recipient of public governmental programs and it has your picture on it, it is not acceptable, okay? We now have court rulings from both district courts in Texas and from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans that have struck down that law. But Texas continues to come back to fight on that. That is a huge issue. It is certainly one that we need to address. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you have Oregon. Interestingly enough, Illinois and West Virginia that have very good motor voter laws and same-day registration so you can register on the same day you vote. So you've got the country going in two opposite directions. In the 2016 election, we had, I believe, 11 states which had stricter um, voter registration qualifications than in the previous election. And there's no question that it affected the turnout. I don't think there's any question about it at all. I don't think it affected the turnout in Milwaukee to the tune of 60,000 voters, uh, which is how much the de Democratic turnout went down. If those voters had come out, Hillary Clinton would have won Wisconsin. So I don't think it's all a photo ID uh, problem. But there's no question that is a problem. These are issues that we need to address. I should have talked about voter ID stuff along with public funding and, and, um, and, and repealing Citizens United and the like. Um, the point is, that when you're talking about the Electoral College, voter suppression, gerrymandering, public funding of campaigns, it is up to us to fix the system. And the record I have found in my reporting over the last three or four years says we can do it. And anybody who tells you it can't doesn't know the score. And what I'm trying to do is get the score out there. So spread the word that Connecticut and Washington and Arizona and even South Dakota are either doing it or working on it. So we can get there. Let's do it.